Hi guys and welcome to your summer homework for psychology. Now obviously you've been sent here from the instructions page um, and you can see that task number one is to watch this video and to make notes. Um, obviously this particular video you can stop and start at any point. Um, you are expected to be making handwritten notes as we go through so don't feel like you've got to keep up with the video. The whole point of doing this is that you can stop it and pause it wherever and um, take the time to understand it um, before you move forward but those notes will be checked by whoever ends up being your psychology teacher next year and um, so it's important that you do make them and that you bring them to your very first session so this is only an introduction to psychology um, but the material that I cover in this video will be uh, tested in your second or third lesson in psychology and um, you will be doing a 30 minute test on this material so it is quite important the only things that we're going to be covering though in this little introductory video is lab experiments and social learning things theory. So, like I said, you should be making notes on this as we go through, but I'm going to briefly introduce you initially to uh, the golden rule of experiments. Now, experiments are the primary research method used by a psychologist. Because we're now classed as a science, virtually everything that we do is experimental in the way that we conduct the research. So what is the golden rule for an experiment? The golden rule of an experiment is that they always, and there are no exceptions to the rule here, they always involve a minimum of two groups. Now those two groups are known formally as conditions. And what we do with those two conditions is that we make a comparison between the groups. So normally, um, in any kind of experiment, you have what we call the experimental group and you have a control group. And I'll come back to that in a little while. But the point is that you always need two groups and that you are looking for a comparison between them. Furthermore, when we talk about experiments, what we are looking for is a difference between the conditions. So we are looking at how one group of participants is different to a second group of participants, depending on what we have manipulated in our research. So always try to remember that, that the golden rule involves <clears throat> a minimum of two conditions, two groups of people, and that we're looking for a difference um, between them and that we're comparing and contrasting those two groups. Remember, that's only a minimum. It, there could be 10, 12, 15 groups of people being compared, but you always need one experimental group and one control group to compare them against. So moving on then, if we are looking for the difference between two groups of individuals, what the researcher has got to have done is manipulated what we call the independent variable. So you should have come across this um, already at GCSE science level, but the independent variable is what the researcher manipulates in an experiment. So this is under the control of the experimenter or the researcher. Basically, by manipulating that independent variable, that is what creates the difference between two groups of people. So for example, if you wanted to see um, what effect caffeine has on um, memory, you would manipulate the level of caffeine that is consumed by your groups of participants. So the independent variable would potentially be one group of participants who are consuming five cups of coffee over 24 hours and a second group of participants who are not uh, not consuming any caffeine. That would be your independent variable. That is what you as a researcher are manipulating between your two groups of participants to create a difference so that you can compare and contrast them. So the IV is amount of caffeine consumed and you can see whether or not that caffeine is, is having an effect on their memory. So that then brings me on to the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is what is being measured by the researcher. So it's what is being recorded. So in the example that I've just given you, the researcher has manipulated the independent variable, i.e. the amount of caffeine that each group of participants have consumed, and they are measuring the impact on their memory. So the, what they're actually recording would 
would be in this scenario, um, for example, the number of words that they can recall or the number of digits they can recall. Okay, so the dependent variable is what they are specifically recording or measuring. Now, when we are looking at experimental research, I've already said to you that the golden rule is to com make a comparison between two different groups of participants. And what we're wanting to see is whether or not the independent variable, which you've manipulated, is having an effect on the dependent variable. Now again, you've probably done this at GCSE science level, but that is what we call cause and effect. And the whole point of conducting experimental research in psychology and the other sciences is to establish cause and effect. So cause and effect is to be able to say that one thing has almost certainly caused another thing to change so that the IV has caused the DV to change. But in experimental research it's not always possible to establish cause and effect because we have a third kind of variable which are really really difficult to control. But fundamentally in an experiment, you are manipulating an independent variable, so that creates two different groups of participants, and you are measuring the effect of that independent variable on the dependent variable. How does that IV cause the DV to change? If it does cause the DV to change, then you have got what we call a cause and effect relationship. If it doesn't result in any change, then the IV is not having any effect at all. So, if you want to pause this video now and just make sure that you've got some good notes on IVs and DVs and just making sure that we understand that before we move forward. Okay, so now we've got the basics of the golden rule of an experiment and what we do in an experiment, i.e. manipulate an IV and measure a DV, trying to establish cause and effect. You also need to know that available to a psychologist, there are three different types of experiments. There is a laboratory experiment, or lab experiment for short, field experiment, and what we call a natural or quasi experiment. Now, I've said to you that the golden rule for any kind of experiment is that they will all involve two kinds of groups, but there are subtle differences in the way that they are conducted. Now, the only one that we're going to concentrate in this particular piece of homework is the lab experiments, okay? The rest of them you will cover um, when you start in September, when we start going through the rest of the research methods topic area with you. So this homework, other than IVs and DVs, is all specifically about laboratory experiments. So, for the different types of experiment, as a psychology student in your exam, there are a number of things that you've got to be able to do. Firstly, you've got to be able to outline what we call the key features. So, the key features are basically what does that particular um, type of experiment involve and then the strengths and weaknesses are what is good about them and what is bad about them okay so giving advantages and disadvantages okay so strengths and limitations so you've got to be able to tell me what they involve and what are the good points and bad points what are the strengths and weaknesses of doing research in that way so if you can, please, it'd be a good idea for you to create a table that looks a little bit like this. So at the top half, you've got the key features of a lab experiment, and there are five of them. And then at the bottom half, you've got space for two strengths and two weaknesses. So if you can pause this now and try to create a little table like that, or you can just make your own notes or a little mind map, it's entirely up to you. So... The key features of a lab experiment are really, really easy to remember. You've just got to ask yourself the following questions. Number one, where do they take place? Number two, what's happening to the independent variable? Number three, what's happening to the dependent variable? Number four, we've got mention of a third kind of variable, which is known as an extraneous variable. And number five, is there anything specifically that happens in the procedure? So if we ask ourselves those questions in any exam, they will give you the key features. So let's start then working our way through what are the key features of a lab experiment by answering those five questions. So the first question that I said we ask ourselves is, where do these types of experiments get conducted? 
Now, you might think it's an obvious answer by saying that a lab experiment takes place in a lab environment. Technically, that's not right because lab experiments don't always take place in a lab, but where they do take place is what we would call a tightly controlled artificial environment. So who is controlling that environment and why is it kind of fake? It's because the researcher is controlling what is going on in that room, wherever that room may be. So it's a tightly controlled artificial fake contrived environment. Okay. Second question I said we have to ask ourselves is what's happening to the IV? So I've already told you a few minutes ago that the IV is being manipulated, okay, by the researcher. So the researcher is directly manipulating the independent variable which creates the two conditions, the two groups of participants, which allows us then to make comparisons between them. So the researcher is directly manipulating the independent variable to measure the effect on the dependent variable, okay? So tightly controlled, artificial, where we're manipulating an IV to measure the effect on the DV. Now, this third type of variable that I referred to earlier on in the video is known as an extraneous variable. Now, in a lab experiment, it's the only type of experiment where you are um, making all attempts to minimize extraneous variables, but it's virtually impossible to actually do that, okay? You try to minimize them, but inevitably there's always going to be some sort of extraneous variable that might be having an effect on the DV. So for that reason, an extraneous variable is classed as, and we need to write this down, a variable other than the independent variable, which might be causing a change in the DV. So to take you back to the example that I mentioned at the beginning, we said that in that example, the IV might be the amount of caffeine consumed and the DV would be recall of words or amount of words recalled. So to think of an extraneous variable in that scenario, we could potentially go for something like intelligence level because the intelligence level is not being manipulated by the researcher, so it's not an IV, but it could potentially affect their ability to recall some digits or some um, words. So IQ or intelligence would be classed as an extraneous variable. It's something other than the IV which could be causing the change in the DV. So obviously if we've got extraneous variables, we're not going to be able to always establish cause and effect. But remember, and you might want to write this down, in a lab experiment, we are trying to make some attempt to get rid of those, okay? And then finally, what we've got in a lab experiment is the use of standardised procedures, okay, whereby each participant has the same experience. So everybody who takes part in that particular um, experiment has got exactly the same experience. Obviously, there's an independent variable which is being manipulated, which will be different for them, but everything else stays exactly the same. The time of day, um, the resources that they see, the instructions that they're given, um, the place where it, it kind of gets conducted, the temperature, all of these things are standard procedures to make sure that everybody's got the same experience. And the reason why we do that is so that somebody else can come along and they can replicate our research. They can repeat it to see whether or not our findings were a one-off or if they are reliable, i.e. they will give us a consistent result over time. So again, you might want to pause this now and just go back over those features. Highlighters are a good idea or coloured pens to make some of these key bits of terminology stand out because these will all be on your test in that second or third lesson when you start college. So if you want to pause this now, um, that's the first kind of section done okay it's still task one but that's the first little bit done what we're going to move on from here is into a little bit of theory and an example of a classic experiment in psychology
Okay then, so one of the most famous experiments that we have in psychology is something known as the Bobo doll experiment and it was conducted by this man here, Albert Bandura and it was part of his theory known as social learning theory which I'll come on to in a moment. Okay then guys, so in those two short video clips you've seen a bit of an introduction to um, Bandura's theory, so this idea that we can learn to be aggressive, and you've also seen um, a video clip from Albert Bandura himself explaining kind of like the manipulation of the variables in this classic lab experiment. So now what we need to look at is we need to look at why uh, the Bobo doll was is classed as a famous lab experiment, but we also need to concentrate a little bit more on his theory. So the theory is where we're going to go next. So this was in reference to the original video that you saw with Michael Mosley. So um, according to Bandora, um, all aggressive behaviour and other behaviours for that matter are learnt through observation and imitation. Okay, so social learning theory was his theory. SLT, social learning theory, is learning through observing and imitating. So watching and copying. Now you will notice that in his video, he used something, uh, the phrase something called modelling on quite a number of occasions. So Bandura suggests that through modelling, i.e. observing and imitation, we learn to copy the behaviour of others. Now we can observe two different types of models. And there are what we call live models, which are people who are right there in front of us. And there are people called symbolic models that we see, for example, in the media or in the news, okay, in TV programmes, in fashion, etc, etc. And Bo uh, Bandora argued, suggested that both of those are equally as influential. Now, the way that he chose to test observation and imitation and the way that he tested his theory, social learning theory, was live modelling. So those children in the Bobo doll study observed a live model demonstrating either aggressive or passive uh, behaviour towards the Bobo doll. So as I said, Bandora in that video clip does repeatedly refer to modelling. Modelling is just simply observing a model, be it live or symbolic, and then whether or not we choose to imitate that behaviour. So, who will we imitate? Again, in that video clip, it's said that the children who were most likely to imitate the aggressive behaviour were boys who had observed a same-sex role model. Now, Bandura argues that for observation and imitation to occur, imitation is more likely when we feel that we've got some similarity to the model that we are watching. For example, if they are the same sex as us. Why do we do that? We do that because we can um, kind of like identify with that particular model. We see a shared characteristic. And if we see that we are similar to them in some way, we assume that we will receive the same outcome. So if we see someone getting rewarded for something and they're similar to us, we'll do it because we assume that we're going to get the same reward. We assume the same outcome. So that's why um, we will imitate people who are more similar to us. So we all observe models, but we're most likely to imitate those models who are not only live, but are very similar to us, for example, the same sex. Now, do we automatically observe and imitate? And Bandura is keen to say in his theory that we don't automatically just copy things. So you don't necessarily go and watch a violent film where somebody's, I don't know, getting their ear chopped off or something. You don't automatically go out and copy that behaviour. Because what happens in between observing and imitating is internal mental processes. So Bandora says that we think about the consequences of our actions. Not only do we think about the outcome, but we also think, is it possible for us to repeat that behaviour? And if we repeat that behaviour, will there be a positive outcome or will there be a negative outcome? So we don't just observe and imitate automatically. We always think about the consequences and that will form a decision 
as to whether or not we want to imitate. So that is Bandura's theory, social learning theory. Remember to write that down. And he tested that using the Bobo doll study, which you've just seen those video clips about. So why then is the Bobo doll study classed as a, a classic laboratory experiment? So if you think back to the beginning of this video, we said that the key features of a lab experiment can be outlined or answered using these five questions. So if we just answer those five questions in relation to the Bobo doll study, we will see why it is most definitely a lab experiment. So again, we need to be writing these down. Where did the study take place? It took place within the psychology labs at Stanford University. So they are controlled and they would have been artificial as you could see in the video clip. What was the independent variable? Now, Bandura referenced this all the way through that second video. Um, the independent variable was whether or not the children were exposed to an aggressive or passive role model. Okay, So some people saw the adult beating up the Bobo doll. Some people saw a nice kind of like pleasant interaction. And then the control condition would have had no model. Okay, What was he measuring? Again, he mentioned this. The measurement or the dependent variable was the level of aggression displayed by the child towards the Bobo doll. Okay, so did they imitate that behaviour? Now, we did say that in a lab experiment, we attempt to minimise extraneous variables, but that it's not always possible. So it isn't possible or it wasn't possible for Bandura to control all extraneous variables. Two extraneous variables that we know could have affected the dependent variable in this particular study is something called demand characteristics. So a lot of people argue that children aren't just didn't just learn to be aggressive what they had done is they were trying to please the researcher all right they were just living up to the expectation of what they thought the researcher and their parents because they were also there doing what they thought they should have done so that's what we call demand characteristics and you're going to learn a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes a second extraneous variable is that some people would argue that the boys were naturally more aggressive simply because they've got higher levels of testosterone, which is a hormone, and that they hadn't learned to be aggressive, it was just built into their nature to be that way. And then the last question is, did he keep the procedure standardised? And you should have picked up in that video on the fact that yes he did standardize absolutely everything they all saw the same doll and they all encountered the exact same uh, set of toys okay so that's why this particular experiment is a lab experiment and in your test on that second or third lesson back they are the questions that you will be asked about okay so what was the iv in this study what was the dv and extraneous variables and so on and so forth okay all right, so now at this point, all we've got left to do in terms of task one is to do a little internet search to look for two strengths and two weaknesses of um, lab experiments. So if you can just pop out of this particular um, window and go into Google, or you can do it on your phone, it's up to you, and I want you to type into Google these four phrases. So we've got ecological validity in psychology, reliability in psychology, demand characteristics in psychology and internal validity in psychology. Now it is important that you type in in psychology because otherwise you'll get a really generic description. We need it to apply to our subject in particular. So do a Google search for those following terms please now and try to write down whether or not you think um, it is a strength or a weakness of a lab experiment. The easiest way to do this is to think whether or not they are high or low in that particular quality. So for example, is a lab experiment high or low in ecological validity? And do you think that that is a good thing or a bad thing? So do that for me now, please, and make some notes. I'll write down in a little table what you think the strengths and weaknesses are. So pause this video for me now, please. Go off and do that search and see what you can find out. Okay. 
So giving you the correct answers then, but this should show you nothing different to what you've already found out. Um, lab experiments tend to be really high in reliability. Why are they high in reliability? Because they use standardised procedures. As I said right at the beginning of this video, everything's kept the same for all participants, which means we can repeat it in future. So our results are very, very reliable. They will give us the same outcome every single time we do that study. Also, a second strength is that lab experiments tend to be higher in what we call internal validity. Because we've minimised extraneous variables, we can be more sure that the IV has caused the change in the DV. So we've got higher internal validity, meaning we can establish cause and effect. However, by conducting our research in a controlled environment, lab experiments tend to be low in what we would call ecological validity. Because they take place in an artificial or fake environment, we can't say for sure that those findings will apply to real life. So for example, in the Bobo doll study, how do we know for sure that outside of that controlled environment that those children would copy or imitate that aggressive behaviour in the same way? We can't do that because you haven't tested it in real life. And furthermore, finally, as we've already said, Lab experiments like the Bobo doll study are very high in demand characteristics. People are very much aware that they are in a lab um, during that particular test and they're not being natural. They're doing what they think the researcher wants them to do. It's likely that they'll probably, probably be able to guess the aim of the study and just meet those expectations of the researcher. So they are the strengths and weaknesses. So now, all we've got at the end of this video is just a really quick recap, okay? And that then completes task number one. So just to recap, lab experiments take place in a controlled artificial environment where the IV is manipulated, the DV is measured, the researcher tries to control or minimise extraneous variables that, that they can't always do that, and they standardise their procedures. As a result of those key features, lab experiments have high reliability and they have high internal validity because we can establish cause and effect. But they are low in ecological validity and very, very high, very high in demand characteristics. Also, furthermore, social learning theory states that we learn through observing and imitating role models and that those um, people that we observe and imitate, we're more likely to imitate them if they are similar to us, and that we think about the consequences before we act. And Bobo Doll's lab experiment took place in a psychology lab, so in a controlled environment. The IV was which model they observed, passive or aggressive. The DV was the level of aggression shown by the child. They all saw the same doll and were exposed to the same toy, but there were some extraneous variables present, um, demand characteristics and the boys having testosterone. So now then, that brings us to the end of task number one. So what do you need to do at this point? You need to go back to the instructions page and go to task two. You need to click the web link, which will take you directly through to Facebook, okay? So at that point, you need to find and like our Facebook page. Then, if you find and like our Facebook page, what you will see is that the last post from us is a link to this site here that called Quizzes and a PIN number. If you click that link to Quizzes, it will take you to a page that looks like this, where it will ask you specifically for your gaming PIN and it will ask you to proceed. All you need to do is enter that five digit code, click proceed, type in your name and click proceed again and it takes you through the quizzes. Now it's random questions, you all got the same questions but in different order and your teacher has got access to those results. You could potentially be playing against some other people at that point in time depending if they're logged on as well. So it's a quite a competitive quiz but your teacher will be able to print off your results so it is important that you try to prove to us that you've been paying attention to that. Furthermore, the final thing you need to do, task number three, is create a resource of some sort. Now, 
In A-level psychology, we really want you to be using apps and electronic uh, resources. Um, so on your phones, if you've got a smartphone, trying to look for any of these apps would be a really, really good idea and get you using them nice and early. So we've got Cram, Chegg, Quizlet and Memrise, which are all kind of flashcard apps. And then in the middle, you've got Kahoot, which is a quiz um, app, which you could generate your own quiz and send it to me if you wanted to, uh, which we could then use in class. So any of those apps listed are a really, really good idea if you've got a smartphone. If you don't, then obviously you can just make a nice mind map of all the stuff that we've covered. But we will be expecting you to download some of those. Now that is all of the material that we want you to cover. Um, you will see at the bottom of the instructions page that there is a web link directly to my email. If you have any problems about any of this material, then please don't hesitate to get in contact with me. So hopefully this has all been good for you and you've been able to follow this material through um, and we look forward to seeing you in early September guys. Thanks very much for watching.